I'm Senator Dick Luger, and I'm pleased to join the Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee for the presentation of the Charles L. Whistler Award. I fondly remember from my time as mayor of Indianapolis how beneficial Gypsy was as we undertook important community endeavors. Gypsy had just begun under Mayor John Barton and expanded during my mayoral administration to play an integral role in helping to formulate and to pass UNIGOV and other civic objectives. As a part of Gypsy, we created the Lawyers Task Force, comprised of attorneys from five local law firms who would provide pro bono legal services to research and draft the necessary legislation to complete the consolidation efforts. Charles Whistler, a visionary and resourceful leader in our community, was selected along with attorney Louis Bowes to lead the Lawyers Task Force. At that time, Charles was president of the Metropolitan Planning Commission and worked tirelessly throughout the community to dispel misinformation and to calm fears that might have otherwise proved damaging during our UNIGEF campaign. It is only appropriate that we present the Charles L. Whistler Award, the most prestigious honor given by the City of Minneapolis Mayor's Office, the persons who share the lifelong leadership and concern for our city, as did our late friend Charles L. Whistler, whose outstanding service brought together the public and private sectors for civic improvement. Charles L. Whistler was born in 1925 near Boswell, Indiana, the seventh of Walter and Gladys Whistler's ten children. He spent his childhood roaming the family's Willow Run Farm, was a good student, and as an early achiever showed prize-winning pigs at the Indiana State Fair. When he was eligible, Charles Whistler enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps, trained as a gunner for B-29 bombers. Whistler eventually attended Indiana University on the GI Bill and was the first member of his family to go to college. In due course, he married the beautiful Kathleen Hartlip, who had defeated him years earlier in a spelling bee at their one-room schoolhouse in Boswell. Charles served on the Law Review Board and graduated from IU School of Law, magna cum laude. Upon graduation, Whistler received a job offer from an attorney back home in northwestern Indiana, but opted instead to accept the position with the firm of Baker and Daniels. A friend and colleague, Steve Terry, recalls that Whistler's background as a farm boy, quote, kept him firmly on the ground. The reason why you want to hire somebody like Chuck, because Chuck taught me that farm boys are very, very hard workers and farm boys work <clears throat> very long hours and farm boys have a sense of the real world. Chuck Whistler worked so hard that Baker and Daniels adopted the Whistler rule requiring every partner in the firm including Steve Terry to take at least two consecutive weeks of vacation each year. Uh, everybody kept that rule Except, except Chuck Whistler, <laughs> and Chuck was the only person who didn't keep the Whistler rule for whom he, it was adopted. Henry Ryder met Whistler when they were both young attorneys specializing in labor law in Indianapolis. It was an interesting field to practice law in because at that time uh, the civil rights uh, movement had uh, really not produced legislation as it did in the early 60s. And we did a lot of negotiations with unions at that time. It builds the kind of uh, negotiating experience that really uh, 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 centralized Chuck Whistler's ability. He, uh, he was an excellent lawyer, and all of the lawyers here and, uh, at Baker and Daniels uh, felt that way about him. Everyone who knew Whistler recognized his ability to negotiate and reach a compromise evident in one of his greatest achievements, helping Dr. Bert Servas and others create UNIGOV, which was the consolidation of city and county government, even today making Indianapolis a model in providing governmental efficiency for taxpayers. I think what he did was to take the bill that was being written that had a number of authors and I think he helped the authors shape that bill. The deeper, the more he, he got into it, the more ideas he had. Those ideas were reflected in ways that he treated the text of the law. 
David Frick worked with Whistler at Baker and Daniels, and later, when Frick became deputy mayor in Bill Hudnut's administration, Whistler served as a trusted advisor. Chuck Whistler uh, was a unique individual. Uh, he took an active interest in those with whom he had association, and he became my, my mentor. And uh, Chuck taught me how to be a good lawyer. Uh, he taught me how to be a community citizen, and he taught a series of values that I still have today. I had additional responsibilities in local government. Uh, I frequently would call Chuck and say, Chuck, what do I do in this situation? What do you think? And he was always there, always available to me. Charles Whistler also cared deeply about Indianapolis landmarks and the city's cultural integrity. Among the buildings he's credited with saving is the old Indiana Theater, current home of the Indiana Repertory Theater at 140 West Washington Street. Uh, people don't realize that incredible landmark uh, that sits on Washington Street was literally a few hours away from the wrecking ball. In a compressed time frame, uh, Chuck Whistler uh, was called upon by me to help me think through how you save that great building and that became kind of the cornerstone for the redevelopment activities in downtown Indianapolis. When the once beautiful Lockfield Gardens apartments fell into a state of urban blight, many wished to see them demolished to make way for market value housing and the growing IU Medical Center. But Whistler helped negotiate a compromise to save a portion of the historic site which held special significance in the African American community. It, it turned out on behalf of Chuck's effort to be a win-win for the entire community. Uh, the historical aspect of that is that this was one of the oldest, largest public housing units built um, in the country and there was a lot of people who really wanted to continue to recognize the significance of that and so I'm happy that Chuck was here to help find that uh, compromise position for the entire community. The uh, legacy that uh, Chuck left, Baker and Daniels, along with the, uh, his contemporaries, uh, was uh, one of a high professional skill, courtesy, uh, gentlemanliness, kindness to people, and fairness, and trustworthiness. Indianapolis lost a great friend and visionary leader when Charles L. Whistler died far too early in 1981. His legacy lives on, however, not only at the city market plaza that bears his name, but also through the Charles L. Whistler Ward. It's the highest honor given annually by the mayor of Indianapolis. He personified what, what uh, was the, the reason that Indianapolis succeeded as a city in growing from a a no-place city to a first-rate city, and that is that partnership between the public and the private. When I had an opportunity uh, to receive the Whistler Award in 1984, uh, I was uh, probably the highest honor one can receive, an award named after your mentor. And the community recognizes your contribution by awarding you something that your mentor is named for. I think he left this as a city of hope. He was a, an effective citizen of his chosen city. To many who knew him well, and many who never will, he was even more. His words unified a county. His actions produced the city we have today. The sports festival uh, was our first big volunteer effort and Michael took on the licensing aspect of that and went around selling the logos and the pins and raising some money for us. So he was part of the team that grew into what the sports corporation ultimately became. Uh, later, of course, it became the operator of the Pan Am Games uh, and there Michael simply saved the games for us by 
managing an enormously difficult problem created when we had many more people show up in all the different Olympic delegations from the 37 countries. And Michael and, his, and some fellows who worked with him, John Adams and others, spent literally 48 hours straight at the Olympic Village working out how to handle this overpopulation and ultimately ended up putting the U.S. team in a private hotel on Michael's credit card uh, to uh, save the day. And if he hadn't done that, the Pan Am Games wouldn't be recalled as today as the great success they, they were. Well, as anybody who knows downtown Indianapolis today knows, the, the canal has been redeveloped into a lovely pedestrian walkway. The White River Park is a gorgeous place housing not just the zoo, but the NCAA headquarters, uh, a performing arts amphitheater, the Idle Jorg Museum. None of that existed in 1979 when we started. The whole amateur sports strategy was aimed at repopulating the central business district, reclaiming that land. So these, these things are not independent of each other. They all build on a base in a sense that uh, if we get our act together, as we have in this city for decades now, uh, we can accomplish as much as any community can. Michael Browning's conceived the idea of Pan Am Plaza and then went about executing it and in effect giving it to the Sports Corporation. I knew Chuck Whistler very well. He was my law partner uh, and in many ways my mentor. Uh, and he was, as this award recognizes, a terrific fellow. Uh, he was one of the smartest lawyers I ever knew, one of the most great-hearted, one of the most even-tempered uh, and most public-spirited uh, people I've ever encountered. Uh, Michael Browning is in that mold. So it's very, very fitting that the Whistler Award go to Michael Browning. The 1970s were a, a very challenging time uh, for Cathedral High School. Uh, the Holy Cross brothers, who had been the teachers at the school, had announced that they would depart. Uh, and clearly the announcement uh, that was heard by folks uh, was that Cathedral would close. Michael uh, was a part of a very small group of individuals who came together and uh, I think by uh, just sheer determination, sheer will, uh, uh, wanted the school to stay open. Um, mythical stories told, individual personal checks being deposited in a cathedral account to make payroll good. Uh, Michael was part of that very small group and I think it's very fair to say that cathedral would not be in existence today were it not for uh, Michael and a group of other men, small in number, uh, who did extraordinary things to maintain the school. Michael has had a, uh, I think, dramatic impact on uh, the understanding of the, the very key role that teachers play uh, in any educational institution. Uh, his uh, efforts begin with uh, simply uh, telling that story, uh, the impact of great teachers on an educational uh, institution such as Cathedral. Uh, he also has invested money. Uh, significantly uh, so that we could continue to uh, recruit and then retain uh, outstanding teachers at Cathedral High School. So I think there's this philosophical messaging as to what's most important and uh, I think that raises the, the level of conversation uh, about what makes great schools great. Uh, and then I think uh, he put uh, uh, money into the mix and he invested uh, in, in great teachers at Cathedral and uh, it has allowed us to build what I think is one of the very fine teaching faculties at a Catholic high school in the country. I got to uh, Cathedral in very late 1999. We did some strategic planning uh, in early 2000 and it became clear we needed uh, to raise money. Um, that leads to a capital campaign. I asked a number of uh, Cathedral loyalists uh, who could successfully lead this campaign that became known ultimately as the Choice of Futures campaign. It was transformative for the school. Uh, there was only one name uh, that uh, was shared with me uh, of an individual who at that time had the stature, uh, the commitment, the passion, the leadership skills needed uh, to be successful, and that was Michael Browning. He asked, who might do this uh, if not uh, me? Uh, I said, I don't have anyone else to take on this responsibility. And he said yes. 
Uh, he personally invested in the campaign. Uh, he used uh, the connections that he has in the greater Indianapolis and in the cathedral community, which is national in nature, uh, and helped us tell a very powerful story uh, about uh, the school and this moment in the school's history. Um, our goal originally was to raise $16 million uh, over five years. Uh, we ultimately uh, raised $18.7 million in a much shorter period of time, and I think that speaks uh, in large part to his personal commitment uh, and to the expectations that he put in place uh, for all of us. Michael Browning is a, um, a person who challenges uh, everyone with whom he works. Uh, whether it's, I'm sure, in the private sector or if it's in a, a volunteer capacity, uh, to do uh, extraordinary things. And I think he creates an environment of high expectations. Um, and I think that's so important uh, in the world today with so many challenges at a school like Cathedral with so many uh, uh, elements that have to be addressed effectively. Um, so I think it is uh, his, uh, his uh, drive for excellence, uh, for outstanding performance. Uh, I think that uh, he enables people to do uh, work uh, sometimes above and beyond uh, what they might have thought that they could have accomplished uh, without his engagement. And uh, he is certainly one of the really important leaders that we have here in Indianapolis and in Indiana. Michael's passion in, in my view and from my experience with Michael is golf, kids, youth, and his family. And, and that kind of defines the person of, of Michael. He's got a real strong focus on golf and um, in addition to helping with the professional golf uh, extravaganzas that have been here, I think probably the most active I've seen him, and it's probably because we worked that event, was with the Solheim Cup, where he lives right across the street from Crooked Stick, and there wasn't a day go by that he wasn't running into the operations trailer and really helping give advice and, and help lead the strategy and so forth. Uh, with the Senior Open, um, we, the Sports Corporation wasn't as active, but we were out there and uh, Michael was visible and, and very active there. Those were huge events for the community. Uh, the Solheim Cup in particular was a, an international women's golf event that I think the attendance was over 100,000 people there that really, really learned about some of these phenomenal golfers that we're seeing today and the women's golf game was really emerging and, and Michael was very interested in excited about it. The Youth Links Charity Golf Outing is something that Michael's been involved with for many years. Um, the event will celebrate its 24th year next year. Of the 24 years, Michael was chair for 19. And during that time, the event really rose to prominence as one of the premier uh, charity golf outings in the Midwest, if not the country. And Michael's um, really really put a lot of energy and a lot of time over 19 years, you can imagine, of, of chairing an event. Um, I think during that time it never rained on Youth Links Day. Michael's been involved in the sports strategy for Indianapolis from day one, um, and that was a, a, a strategy born out of a passion for this city and an attempt to build a place that was great to attract business, attract talent, a great place to raise kids, and a great place for our own kids to really want to stay and, and raise their families. That's what this was all about, and Michael really never let us forget that. On the board of directors of the Sports Corporation, or his involvement with bringing the NCAA headquarters here, um, all of those things were about building a city and building a brand, a world-class city. I think Michael has a deep philosophical uh, value system that, um, that I really appreciate and I've really watched and, and learned from, and that is he's, you know, he's a very successful businessman here in this community. And his, his value system is that you give back and you give back mightily, and he has. He's extremely generous. His point of view and his wisdom is sought by governors and mayors and, um, and other people, regardless of their 
of their political affiliation and it's, it's just very well thought of and, and is a treasure. And I hope when he retires, he doesn't pick up his golf clubs and go someplace, not Indianapolis. I think he needs to stay here. Well, Michael's greatest strengths, really, when you think about a community, what makes it go? Caring for those who don't have us so much and making sure they get opportunity, that's a great contribution. A great community needs visionaries, people that will take big ideas, support big ideas, game-changing ideas. He does that big ideas around sports, different big paradigm changers, the work we've been doing at Marion University, he's been on the, on the forefront, leading, investing, getting others to invest, helping figure out how to do it. And as I mentioned before, it isn't only about those so you know the privilege could become more privileged. Michael has an eye and a mind and a heart to make sure everybody gets a shot. And they usually say to you as the CEO, you need to do this or you ought to do that or you ought to get them to help you. He always will, he says it different. He always says, we. We ought to go get this done. And it's nice to have a we type person on your side, especially an incisive one and a generous one, and one that doesn't forget that there's all levels and dimensions society need to be improved. Finally, the type of person, Michael, is uh, if you have a a bunch of small ideas and little things you want to work on, you probably wouldn't want to waste his time. He's really good at picking up big things that are paradigm changers and create a whole new level situation. And I've heard him say more than once, when people do big things in the community, we need to rally around those big things that are going to make a difference long term. When we told him about the idea of starting a football team at Marion, who was formerly an all-women's college, he said, well, that's pretty good idea you know so he helped out with that and then we said we're gonna start a medical school we only have one medical school in the state and he said now that is a big idea uh, I was pleased to nominate him for this award and I'm glad that the the wise people who uh, look at all these wonderful candidates because I know they get some very talented people uh, it, it was a good move to at this time to recognize Michael Browning for the Whistler Award